स नौ सह वीर कर्वाहे तेजस्वीनावदितमस्तु मिदिषावै ओ शाति 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 Dear students, today we are going to discuss about osteomyelitis. As you are all aware, osteomyelitis is one of the most difficult and challenging problem encountered in orthopedics. From the life-threatening acute osteomyelitis to the disabling chronic osteomyelitis, it frustrates and thwarts. the best efforts of the orthopedic surgeons the devastating effects of osteomyelitis on a bone and its neighboring joints are the tale of dismay and gloom it has been our common clinical experience that the incidence of acute osteomyelitis is definitely on the wane and the incidence of chronic osteomyelitis is on rise this is primarily because of rise in the road traffic accidents leaving a bizarre of compound and complex fractures which are the major cause of infection in the bone this is followed next with the rise in the infection rate following surgeries on the bones and joints the fall in the incidence of acute osteomyelitis could probably be explained to the frequent and early use of antibiotics in patients presenting with fever the fall in the mortality rate due to acute osteomyelitis is a welcome trend but equally worrying is the high incidence of chronic osteomyelitis which is a disturbing trend the fall in the mortality rate is compensated by the rise in morbidity rate while well, the ideal thing would be a fall in the both the rates now by definition osteomyelitis is defined as a separative process of the bone caused by pyogenic organisms or simply a pyogenic infection of the calcellus portion of the bone as you can see in this particular picture osteomyelitis is classified depending upon three things the duration of the symptoms the route of the spread of infection and the host response so depending upon the duration of the symptoms it could be classified into four groups acute osteomyelitis when the duration is less than 2 weeks subacute osteomyelitis when duration is between 2 to 3 weeks chronic osteomyelitis when the duration is more than 3 weeks and finally the residual depending upon the route of spread it could be a hematogenous route direct route or contiguous route the osteomyelitis because of a hematogenous route or a direct route or contiguity and depending upon the host response the osteomyelitis could be either a pyogenic osteomyelitis or a non pyogenic osteomyelitis hematogenous spread with primary infection being elsewhere like tonsillitis acute separative otitis media pyoderma etc is the common mode of spread spread from the neighboring infective sites like septic arthritis and direct inoculation of the infecting organisms by way of penetrating wounds punctured wounds trauma etc comes second let us today discuss more about acute osteomyelitis etiology the etiological factors causing osteomyelitis can be best understood if discussed under the following head now if you look at this particular diagram a triangle consisting of agent the causative organism the host the patient environment general or local factors so look looking at the agent factors the following myriads of incriminating organisms is responsible for causation 
S series organism. S denotes severe osteomyelitis and those organisms it starts with the letter S. So what are they? First is the Staphylococcus aureus. 60 to 85 percent of the times osteomyelitis causative organism is Staphylococcus aureus. This is the most common organism causing acute osteomyelitis. The second organism is Streptococcus hemolyticus, 8 to 10 percent. Third one is Salmonella. Now the osteomyelitis here is relatively rare due to Salmonella and the, it presents an interesting picture as most of its feature they also start with S. What are those S? The first S is several bones involved. Second S is symmetrical involvement of the bones. Third S, severe osteomyelitis. Fourth, spine may be involved. Fifth, sickle cell anemia is often present. And sixth, stool culture may be positive. So remember these six S characteristic features of the Salmonella osteomyelitis. Then there are P series organisms. Now again, the interesting thing is their mode of entry is through punctured wound and they include Pseudomonas and Pneumococcus. The C series organism, here C series, C denotes compound fractures. So they are Clostridium melchii and coliforms, that is E. coli. Then B series, Brucella bacillus. H series, Haemophilus influenzae. Now this is known to cause osteomyelitis in the age group of 7 months to 4 years. T series, tepon, Triponema pallidum, that is syphilitic osteomyelitis and tubercle bacilli, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Then it could be a fungal osteomyelitis and the funguses responsible can be remembered using the mnemonic A, B, C. A stands for actinomycosis, B for blastomycosis, C for cryptococcosis and coxidomycosis. These usually cause the chronic osteomyelitis. Now coming to the host factors, age. In children, the incidence is 88% because they are more prone for injury and to fall. In others, it is just a 12% and hence it is predominantly a disease of childhood. Another host factor, sex, male prepartners. Why? Because they are more playful. The third one is economic status. The low socioeconomic group are more susceptible. Now coming to the environmental factors which could be divided into general factors and local factors. So general factors include anemia, debility, infection, poor nutrition and poor immune status. Now all the above mentioned general factors, they bring down the resistance of the patient and thereby making them susceptible for the infection. The local factors include hairpin bed vessels in the metaphysis, metaphysal hemorrhages, defective phagocytosis in the metaphysis, rapid growth at metaphysis, necrotic tissue becoming a good culture media and anoxia and vasospasm. Now these local factors are extremely important in localizing the infection to the metaphysis. Now look in the picture of the metaphysis where you find the hairpin bend of the metaphysical vessels. Now this slows down the circulation for a moment which is sufficient for the organisms to escape out. Second metaphysical hemorrhage, it results from the bleeding due to the microscopic trauma. The blood clot so accumulated acts as an excellent culture media for the escaped organism to grow. Then defective phagocytosis, WBCs here in the metaphysical area are busy removing the debris of the decalcification due to the growth process. And therefore, 
their function of eliminating the offending organism is slightly impaired here. Then rapid growth at the metaphasis. It makes the cells more susceptible to the action of bacterial toxin as the cells are immature. Vessus passer, though protective as it arrests further bleeding from the traumatized vessel, it also causes anoxia and failure of antibiotics and other defenses from reaching the area. Anoxia, due to vessus passer, it helps the bacteria to grow and thus acute osteomyelitis develop because of the combination of agent, host and the environmental factors. Let us see the pathophysiology. The infection results in the formation of an abscess, as shown the yellow color in this particular diagram, at the region of metaphysis. The pus so formed finds its way out through the area of least resistance. Now, if you look in children less than 2 years, periosteum is loosely attached to the cortex and hence forms a potentially weak point. The subperiosteal abscess so developed will either spread through the soft tissues or drain to the outside by forming a sinus breaking the skin or it will percolate down towards the diaphysis between the periosteum and the cortex and then enter the shaft through the widened haversian pores due to anoxia. Now in the children less than two years of age, the growth plate limits the spread to the joint. Between the age 2 and 16 years, the periosteum is firmly attached to the cortex. And with the growth plate still present, the pus has to spread towards the diaphysis at a low, slow pace. But in case of children above 16 years, the growth plate has disappeared. The periosteum is firmly adherent and the pus spreads towards the diaphysis very slowly. Now this particular diagram, a diagrammatic representation of pathophysiology, you can draw in your exams, where A denotes the sequestrum, B the periosteum, C pus, D cortex, E involucrum, F bone abscess, and G, medullary cavity. So the quick facts regarding the spread in acute osteomyelitis are described in this particular table. As you can see, if the patient is less than 2 years, so the subperiosteus spread is common, diaphysis, diaphysial spread is rare, and joint space are involved rarely. Whereas in the children between 2 to 16 years, subperiosteal spread is rare, diaphysis, diaphysial spread is common but it is slow and in children after 16 years of age, diaphysial is common but very slow, joint space is involved often and the extraperiosteal spread is very rare. Coming to the clinical features, as you can see in this particular picture in the left leg, They involved the acute osteomyelitis. Acute osteomyelitis is a clinical catastrophe. It presents in the following manner. First is the fever. This is the most common presenting symptom. This child usually has a high fever and is associated with profuse sweating, chills and rangers. Then sometimes the presentation is so acute that the child may be in shock and unconscious. Second common presenting feature is the swelling. Now as you can see with the yellow uh, arrow it is being shown, this usually follows the fever and may affect the ends of the long bones. The swelling may be acutely painful and the skin may appear red. Limitation of movement is the third clinical feature. Child may not move the joint near the affected bone due to pain and swelling. In fact, 
the child may lie still without moving the joint and this is sometimes called a state of pseudo paralysis. So this particular chart shows us the signs and symptoms general and local. So the general symptoms include the fever 95% cases, sweating, chills and rigors, patient is usually in shock. Local symptoms include the local swelling in 80% of the cases, limitation of movements in 50% of the cases. As far as signs are concerned, you can say the general signs includes the febrile patient is febrile, have tachycardia, anemia, dehydration and shock. Locally, there will be tenderness in 80% of the cases, there may be local arrhythmia 50% of the cases, raised local temperature in 50% cases, fluctuation may be seen in 20%, effusion may be there in 10% and decreased movements in almost 50% of the cases. Now the last, this table has shown us the clinical sign consists of the general and local signs. The general features of anemia, dehydration, paraxia, tachycardia, shock and toxicity may be present. The local swelling may show increased temperature, may be tender to touch and the skin is stressed. Movement of the neighboring joint are decreased, there may be effusion in them too. The investigation wise, the investigation of the acute and chronic osteomyelitis here in this particular table are compared for easy remembrance and understanding. So, in acute osteomyelitis, HB% percent may be normal or decreased. In chronic osteomyelitis, it is often decreased. ESR in acute osteomyelitis may be normal or increased. In chronic osteomyelitis, it is often increased. WBCs in acute osteomyelitis, neutrophils, they increased. Whereas in chronic osteomyelitis, lymphocytes increased. Radiology. In less than 48 hours, if you look uh, this x-rays, few changes are seen. In less than 48 hours, few changes are seen. Only rarefaction is the earliest sign. Now you look at the metaphysical area of the right uh, tibia. Loss of demarcation of the line between the subcutaneous shadow and the muscle may be seen. Appearance of transverse line of increased densities outward from the muscle may be seen. But more than two weeks, now you can see a periosteal newborn formation as shown by the yellow arrow here. Rarefaction is also seen. Bone scans using technetium 99M or gallium 67 or indium 111 labeled leukocytes are done. And it confirms the diagnosis as early as 24 to 48 hours after the onset of osteomyelitis in 90 to 95 percent of the cases. As shown by the red arrow, focal areas of early uptake is seen, but it cannot distinguish a tumor from the infection, and hence the bone scans become non specific. The blood culture taken at the three different times at least 2 hours apart, they are seen positive in 60% of the cases. Gram staining, aspirate from the infected bone is tested with the gram staining. It helps to choose the appropriate antibiotics. Here this picture shows the streptococcal pneumonia in the gram stain. The treatment principles in the acute osteomyelitis are depicted in this particular diagram. Now, here if you look at A, A indicates IV fluids and blood transfusion, B, tapered sponging to take care of fever, C, the intravenous antibiotics to control the infection, D, cryotherapy, E, splint and elevation of the affected parts and F, rest in bed and hospitalization. The pneumonia rests R-E-S-T-S. -E rest sums up the conservative line of treatment. What is this rest means? R for rest, E for elevation, S for systemic, 
E for treatment and S for surgery. Now rest in bed protects the affected part with the splint to alleviate the pain and spasm. Elevation of the part warm and moist packs to reduce the swelling. Systemic treatment includes the blood transfusions, intravenous fluids to correct shock and hypovolemia. With the antibiotics, systemic treatment with the antibiotics discussed below to help reduce the toxicity and surgery when properly indicated and time to prevent the complications. The principles of antibiotic therapy. This is the mainstay of treatment in acute osteomyelitis. Lack of understanding of the correct principles of antibiotic therapy in acute osteomyelitis leaves a sick way in the form of chronic osteomyelitis. And this underlies the importance of the correct antibiotic therapy. And that can be described using all A's. What are those A's? So appropriate drug, appropriate route, appropriate dose, appropriate duration and appropriate adjective measures. Appropriate drugs. Usually the drug chosen is a broad spectrum bactericidal agent. Appropriate route means intravenous route for the first two weeks and then oral for next four weeks. Appropriate dose means the dose of the drug depending upon the body weight of the patient. Then appropriate duration on time to stop when the disease is eradicated, controlled or resistance or side effects to the drugs develop. Then you need to stop the drug. Appropriate adjunctive measures may a combination of ampicillin and cloxacillin are found to be very effective. Though penicillin G is still the drug of first choice in our country. Fusidic acid is preferred in the western countries. Now the current trends in the antibiotic therapy. This consists of a short course of intravenous antibiotics for a period of two weeks followed by oral antibiotics for further four weeks. Proper monitoring of the serum antibiotic level is very much essential to obtain the good results. Now there are something known as Nardes principle. You need to understand it. Nardes principle for acute osteomyelitis aptly sums up the action of antibiotic therapy. He has formulated five rules. One, an appropriate antibiotic is effective before pus forms. Two, antibiotics cannot sterilize avascular tissue. Three, antibiotics prevent reformation of pus once removed. Four, pus removal restores the continuity between the periosteum and the cortex which restores the blood flow. And five, antibiotics should be continued after the surgery. Now, Nade has described the local management principles as well. The focus here is on well-timed surgery if any one of the following indication is present. So what are those indications? One, abscess formation. Two, severely ill and moribund child. Three, failure to respond to the intravenous antibiotics for more than 48 hours. Now, what are the antibiotics used in osteomyelitis? So, commonly used antibiotics in the treatment of osteomyelitis includes penicillin, beta-lactamase inhibitors, cephalosporins and ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, parenteral IV antibiotics for 4 to 6 weeks, oral antibiotics for 2 to 4 weeks. Local antibiotics. Now, antibiotics impregnated cement beads, they provide high dose of antibiotics locally. As you can see in this particular picture, a cement bead is inserted in the wound. Surgical methods. Depending upon the situation, any one of the following surgical methods could be employed. 
aspiration as you can see in this particular picture it helps in decompression and the material so obtained may be used to identify the organisms and check for the antibiotic sensitivity in season and drainage it helps to drain the subcutaneous abscess then multiple holes if the abscess is subperiosteal this technique helps to drain the pus by making multiple holes in the cortex small bone window if the multiple drill holes do not drain the pus a small window of the bone is removed from the cortex and the pus is evacuated coming to the differential diagnosis there are five points one is acute septic arthritis second is scurvy third is acute anterior poliomyelitis fourth is cellulitis and fifth other conditions like erysipelas erythema erythema nodosum ewing sarcoma sickle cell anemia etc acute septic arthritis here the infection is in the joint in osteomyelitis it is in the bone near the joint and hence the joint movements are severely restricted in septic arthritis and they are more painful and hence child will not at all allow you to move the joint however in case of acute osteomyelitis if very sympathetically you ask the child he may move the joint second is scurvy the features of pseudo paralysis bleeding gums tender limb etc are the features in case of acute anterior poliomyelitis here the pain and tenderness are spread throughout the muscle mass whereas in osteomyelitis tenderness is greatest on direct pressure over the bone only then the next is the cellulitis it is difficult to differentiate from the acute osteomyelitis however cellulitis has no age no fluctuation no pus and no limits other differential diagnosis includes erysipelas erythema nodosum ewing's sarcoma sickle cell anemia it is you have to be very careful then now what are the complications of acute osteomyelitis these complications are seen in 5% of the cases the first and foremost is the septicemia and pyemia are the common general complications second septic arthritis septic arthritis due to extension of the neighboring fossa of infection into the joint third is chronic osteomyelitis chronic osteomyelitis develops due to the improper and inadequate treatment the incidence rate is 5 to 10 percent fourth the pathological fractures and the growth disturbances they are relatively rare fifth the recurrence in osteo acute osteomyelitis now in case of metatarsals involved then recurrence is more than 50 percent if the acute osteomyelitis is seen around the knee then the recurrence rate is more than 25 percent and due to the late diagnosis again the recurrence may be more than 25 percent mortality rate is less than two percent due to early antibiotic therapy what are the what is the prognosis so the bad prognostic factors they are described as age in the pediatric age group it is a bad prognosis agent if it is staphylococcus aureus bad prognosis site if it is nearer to the trunk bad prognosis what is the natural course 90 percent resolve due to early diagnosis and effective antibiotic therapy 8% may show morbidity and 2% may have mortality so to summarize the characteristic points in the acute osteomyelitis the disease is common in children staphylococcus aureus is the common organism metaphysis is involved fever is 
the common presenting symptom bone scan helps in early diagnosis and conservative management is the mainstay of treatment and 90% patients are dissolved and hence acute osteomyelitis in epiphysis is taken to be caused by staphylococcus aureus unless proved otherwise please do like subscribe and share to all your colleagues in other medical colleges and let me help them to learn orthopedics thank you thank you for your patient listening